let's talk a little bit more about the beliefs of Javier Millet because he does have very strong beliefs. You, you know, you mentioned him in the context of Trump, Bolsonaro, Orban. Uh, there's a tendency to kind of like lump all these people together, which I think is a mistake and part of what we're going to disentangle a little bit here. Um, I watched a 2019 TEDx talk that Millet gave, which was really an ode to capitalism. Uh, we're going to play a bit of that and then discuss Millet's intellectual framework a bit more. Um, it'll be subtitled in Spanish. And for the audio only podcast, I will overdub this in English. But here's Javier Millet at TEDx in 2019. Y esto es una charla de una historia de amor. Mi historia de amor con las ideas de la libertad. Y tiene tres capítulos, porque en la medida que uno va estudiando y va profundizando en esto, el romance va surgiendo de distintas maneras. Lo primero que me enamoró del capitalismo y la libertad, básicamente fue que es una máquina de sacar gente de la pobreza, que es la máquina de la prosperidad, que es la máquina del bienestar. Pero claro, cuando uno avanza en esta idea, se encuentra con detractores. Detractores que acusan al sistema de ser injusto. Entonces, el segundo momento del romance arranca cuando uno se empieza a poner a estudiar sobre, básicamente, si el sistema es justo o no. Y uno lo que descubre, que no solo que es justo, sino que además es el único sistema que es justo. So that's the button down rational sounding Millet, and he sounds very much like a libertarian economist there. We'll get to some of the spicier stuff soon, but Eduardo, as a fellow Argentine libertarian economist, what can you tell us about Millet's economic ideas? Well, at the beginning, he was an econom econometri econom econometrist, so he mm -hmm. believed in plan models, and just studying statistics, you can foresee what the future would, would be. So he was working for corporations, <coughs> trying to give them some a kind of sense of where the markets were going, but without a solid base of understanding, I don't know, Israel, Kirchner, uh, Kirchner or some uh, Kirchner, or uh, the good economists are explaining uh, Hayek that uh, what is the dispersed knowledge in the economy. So he, just, he didn't have too much knowledge related to it. But once he started to study Mises, Hayek, Rothbard in Argentina, Benegas Lynch, that he was the promoter of Austrian economics. So he little by little started to believe in the market processes and <coughs> he started to buy them. So uh, it's true what he's saying in his TED talk what is saying that he really learned how the markets operate and also he started to realize how capitalism transformed the world in the last two or three centuries. So when he saw that, what he saw the effects of the Industrial Revolution and he started to realize that the type of life we live today are a consequence of changing ideas and a little bit of John Locke, a little bit of Jefferson, a little bit of Benjamin Franklin, a little bit of John Adams and Alexis de Tocqueville. He, I don't think he really read them in, in deep, but mm -hmm. he got that feeling. And, and after that, Argentina, that has been a fascist and socialist, socialist country for several decades, suddenly uh, he discovered that the idea that necessity creates rights the idea of social justice, the idea that, uh, that uh, the wealth is fixed and when you make money is at the expense of somebody else, uh, he started to discover that all those ideas are wrong. I don't know how deep his knowledge is related to these justice issues, but I really think that uh, he has the proper sense of life he became little by little a kind of individualist. He's probably, he's a, still a little bit altruistic, a little bit mystic in uh, uh, just in, in some approaches, but 
the sense of life is individualistic. He's in favor of uh, he if he if you ask him how to interpret and defend property rights, or he can do it. If he if you ask him about um, the your right to look for your own happiness, he knows how how justify that. So I think that mm -hmm. compared with some other politician, he's a strong leader understanding some issues. His character is too strong for my my, my <laughs> pleasure. The way he speaks, he looks like Benito Mussolini. But still, the, the way he approaches subjects is pretty good. Uh, the way that he's been portrayed here in by the US media is, uh, I just pulled it together a little montage of headlines. Argentinian far-right outsider Javier Millet Post shock win in primary election in Argentina, a new Trump rises. Far right populist Javier Malay is the biggest vote getter in Argentina's presidential primary. Mm -hmm. uh, new York Times far right libertarian. So uh, they did describe him as a libertarian, but a far right libertarian wins Argentina's presidential primary. And then I just want to dig into the New York Times description of his policy positions here for a second. He says that. They say that besides his ideas about the currency and the central bank, which is something we're going to get to later, because that's that's central to the Malay candidacy, I think. Uh, but they say he has proposed drastically lowering taxes and cutting public spending, including charging people to use the public health care system, closing or privatizing all state owned enterprises and eliminating health, education and, and environmental ministries. Um you know, uh, I that 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 all sounds to me like fairly straightforward li libertarian policy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Spanish newspaper El País had a rundown of uh, some of his positions on social issues. Yep. Uh, but uh, marriage between people of the same sex. For me, marriage is a contract between private individuals, says Millet. Homosexuality. Sexuality is lived. It, uh, as lived is a personal choice. Drug legalization. They say that Millet is in favor of drug legalization because his consumption is an individual action. Uh, they say the same thing here about gender identity. Uh, Millet's kind of spicy statement here is, do you want to perceive yourself as a cougar? Do it. Doesn't matter to me as long as you don't make me pay the bill. Don't impose it on me from the state. Right. Um, he wants to deregulate the legal arms market, which means allowing legal uh, firearms ownership. Um, he says he's not an advocate of the military, Argentine military dictatorship, although he is taking a look at what Bukele is doing in El Salvador that may or may not be of interest to him. Um, I should also mention here that he uh, supports a referendum to undo Argentina's recent abortion rights law. So he's, he's anti-abortion. He's also trying to wage uh, uh, some of the same gender studies, schools fights that are raging here in the U.S. Um, and last thing here is he's expressed a, uh, a natural alliance with figures like Trump and Brazil's Bolsonaro because he says they're, he's on the side of anyone against communism and socialism. Um, but I was saying earlier to uh, Eduardo that I, I don't think it's particularly illuminating to say that Trump equals Bolsonaro equals Orban equals Malay, especially because Malay, well, we may have some criticisms of him, does look different from the rest. But Gloria, what is your overall reaction to the kind of far right characterization of Javier Malay? Well, I think and, and, and I, I agree with Eduardo that it is important to understand Argentinian history in order to un understand the massive ignorance that there is, especially in Latin America, of what the libertarian movement portrays. For example, myself. I was graduated from Universidad Francisco Marroquín, UFM. I did an internship at the Cato Institute. I've dedicated my life for the libertarian principles and to diffuse them not only in Latin America, but elsewhere in the world. And now I have people saying that I am not a libertarian because I don't want the state getting involved 
in issues like abortion, gay marriage, drug legalization, opening borders, not only to products, but also to people. They tell me that I have uh, become a Marxist because of this. Hmm. So if I can fall into the category of Marxist because the understanding of what libertarianism is in Latin America is so vague, of course you're going to have confusion all over the planet on, one, on what Javier Milei portrays, right? Personally, right. Let's, let, let's go uh, every subject that you touch because I think that if we uh, start focusing on policies instead of focusing on individuals, we dismantle the populism that there is. I don't like analyzing politicians as dogmatic uh, mess, mess, messiahs. I like analyzing policies to see how the policies are more or less libertarian. I think the more that we do that, the less fanatism and dogmatism we're gonna have. And I think we're in a world that highly needs that. Uh, for the Putins, the Bolsonaros, the Trumps, but also the Chavez, the Ortegas, the, the, the Evo Morales, the Lulas of the world. We have, we have people going blindly after people, after leaders, instead of going very strict after policies. When Javier Milei <clears throat> says to you that gay marriage is something he doesn't believe because he doesn't believe that the state should regulate marriage, I say, well, then what's the proposal going to be? Is a straight marriage going to be something from the past? Is he going to take away the state in every marriage? I don't think mm -hmm. so, right? But it's a mm -hmm. really nice way of saying, I'm not going to touch the issue. So, you know, advancing in uh, sexual liberty and liberty to love whoever you want to love in Latin America, I think is a, is a huge one. And also differentiating that from using the state to educate people and indoctrinate people in things that you don't want kids to be indoctrinated. That's why the state shouldn't get involved in education, because right. if, the, if the state is Nazi, your kids are going to be Nazis. If the state is communism, communist, etc. And if you right. go now to drugs, when he says, well, everybody is, you know, allowed to consume whatever they want to consume. That's OK. But drugs are not only about consumption. It's also about who is <clears throat> producing them. And we know as a fact that the drug cartels from Colombia to FARC to uh, Mexico, all the cartels have financed socialism of the 21st century. Right. It is one of the pillars. And we as libertarians in the region have been saying for decades that unless Latin America legalizes, decriminalizes the production of these substances, we are not going to have transparent politics because mm -hmm. it's a super highway of financing all these leaders without any accountability, without any transparency. So when he says everybody can consume whatever the hell they want, He's also like retrieving himself as a libertarian into taking action in these issues, right? Now, when you go to Argentina, people are super concerned about inflation, about wages. So they tell you, you know what? I don't care about the gays. I don't care about the drugs. I just want my money to be a, a, a healthy money. I just want to do business in a healthy way. I want my savings to be, you know, guaranteed. And I understand that because Argentina has one of the worst inflations that you can have. And when the economy, you know, it's, it's, it's pushing ahead, then of course that you're gonna be okay. So that's where we need to ask ourselves, if Javier Milei comes to power, is he going to have a Congress that will support him into uh, opening up to the markets? Because Argentina mm -hmm. currently is one of the worst countries in the world in the index of economic freedom. So you need to maybe dollarize it to open up to new currencies, including cryptocurrencies, which are big in Argentina, but they are illegal. There's, there are two different uh, prices of dollars in Argentina, the black market one and the, the one that the government uses. So even if mm -hmm. in economy, we have to ask ourselves, what is he going to be capable of doing now regarding abortion? It is true that nowadays Argentinians 
conservative Argentinians that support Javier Milei and, and, and other leaders like him have paid more than 30,000 abortions yearly with their taxes since abortion was something that uh, it started to be a state uh, introduced or managed in 2021 uh, from, from the policy of 2020, December 2020, right? So you're talking mm -hmm. about 30,000 abortions yearly and uprising. So when he says that he's going to take that back, he could also have the stance of a libertarian, which are not understood in Latin America, because you can be a libertarian and be against the state paying for abortions, but taking away the state so that the market offers them. Hmm. Unless we as a libertarians communicate properly what are the libertarian ideas, Javier Milei and other leaders will be portrayed by the media as super far right. Now, the last issue that I want to discuss, supporting Trump, Orban, Bolsonaro, and Putin has become a one-deal package in Latin America. And we have been called not true libertarians when we, and I mean we, like me, Antonella Marti, the Libertarian Party of Spain, or even objectivists in Enran Center Latin America, where Maria Eduardo's sister uh, works, when you say, wait a minute, I don't think that Trump is, is having libertarian stance or Bolsonaro, you, you get crucified in social media. And people tell you that unless you are with them, you are not a true libertarian. So I think that we have to understand what is it that, you know, differentiates Javier Milei from a Ronald Reagan, Christian, a free market guy from like a true libertarian. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think the only way of doing that is analyzing what libertarian policy means. But so w when I look at that list of his stances on social policies, I would agree with you that, you know, the, the abortion issue is, is a big wedge. I mean, that's a wedge even uh, within the American libertarian movement. There's yeah. there's division on that topic. Um, I think you're saying that at the very least, a libertarian could or, you know, you, you're you think that the correct libertarian position would be no state funding for abortion, but allow people to, uh, you know, make their own decisions there. Is, is that more well, or less? Yeah. Currently, according to the Encyclopedia of Libertarianism, which is already from 2011, 30% of libertarians are pro-life, what we would call, mm -hmm. you know, anti-abortion. 70% are pro-choice, right? Which I think yeah. it's also, uh, as Anne Rand accurately say, you can have a pro-life statement for abortion. But even in the pro-life libertarians, they do not agree that you should criminalize women and put them in jail because abortion should be considered a crime. There mm -hmm. are interviews where Javier Milei and people who support him have said that we should use the state and the machinery of the state to criminalize women who go under abortion. How does that enter the umbrella of libertarianism? It, even by anarcho-capitalists, I, I, I say to them, mm -hmm. how is it that you don't want a state, but you're going to have a private police that is going to persecute uh, women and their, and their uterus? Like, how, how is, how is mm -hmm. that going to work, you know? And they don't have a straight answer, but they want to make abortion something that the state criminalizes. Yeah. And then just so I understand on these other topics where he seemingly is in alignment with libertarian philosophy on drug use or sexuality, uh, you're saying that, um, you know, he's saying he's OK with drug use, but not offering a policy like we need to end the prohibition of drug sales in Argentina or in the case of gay marriage, uh, he's, um, you know, saying people can do whatever they want, but he's not actually advancing like a equal protection for gay couples in Argentina. Is that I just want to make sure I'm understanding your point. Is that a correct summation? Absolutely. It's like, you know, we, if, if libertarianism is all about individual rights equal for everybody right now in Latin America, the, the lesbian, gays, trans they do not have equal rights in markets. For example, 
you cannot, if you're not married, you don't have the benefits that straight couple have in order to have inheritance. In order to go to a cell phone company and get a family package for all your family, if you're talking about two lesbians, they don't get those benefits in the market. You know what I mean? So those are things that marriage uh, gives you uh, individual rights for straight uh, people that right now the LGBT community does not have. I think that as a libertarian, you can move forward to that, even, even if you say that marriage shouldn't be something that the state should regulate. Okay, but let's be equal to everybody. And then your libertarian platform should be, let's get, let's get rid of straight marriage and let's make marriage something that only the market uh, does. But then what happens? You cannot, you can have a celebration of a gay wedding, but you cannot use, you know, lawyers uh, or, or anything to protect your rights. That is the thing in Latin America. The same with prostitution. Javier Milei can say, well, there's the sexual market. You can do whatever you want. But if you don't decriminalize prostitution, prostitution keeps being something that the black market, market operates in criminalization. Is it's like if in the United States during the prohibition, you would have a candidate saying, hell, people can drink whatever alcohol they want to, but he's not willing to end the prohibition. What do you think of that critique, uh, Eduardo? Uh, and after this, we're going to bring in a couple more melee clips so that our, our audience can really get a sense of, you know, the kind of rhetoric that he uses to, to advance his ideas. But what do you think of Gloria's critique of Millet's, you know, social positions that maybe he kind of throws a bone to libertarians, but he's not actually advancing policies that are going to increase social freedom in Argentina? I think that Gloria is 100% right. <laughs> he did a perfect description of the way Javier thinks. I, I'm pretty optimistic. I think he was a kind of middle of the road, a little bit collectivist, and he started to understand the benefits of individualism and liberalism five years ago. And he's smart. He's very passionate. I think his sense of life is, is conservative, but he's becoming more an individualist. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding abortion, for example, his last declaration, his last speech says that, okay, I will not uh, penalize abortion. I'm not in favor of that, but I want to stop financing abortions. Okay. And that would become a little bit mm -hmm. very consistent with the libertarian idea. I don't know if maybe in his next declaration mm -hmm. he's going to say the same, but it seems that he's running little by little a, a way of, uh, of conservatives but at the same time, I'm afraid that that can also happen with economic principles. The idea of closing the central bank, that for me is a great idea. Yeah. The idea of uh, reducing all taxes. We had 167 taxes and he suggested to <coughs> stay with six or seven uh, taxes to reduce uh, the size of government to 20% of the PBI expenditures. So all that, uh, he has been very aggressive, very consistent. But for yeah. example, his last declaration, he said that he doesn't want to keep financing the CONICET, the science uh, research. And the whole country went after him saying, you are going to stop financing research in science and culture, things that are so important. This is a broken country with people making, I don't know, $3,000 a year. So with people searching in, in the garbage to eat, you have 45, 50% of people in poverty. So a good president would come and say, we are going to cut all expenditures. We will have a healthy uh, money and a very, very short and, uh, budget. So we, uh, uh, we are trying to advise Javier that if he really gained uh, the presidency, 
to just to act on principle, just a very small government, very consistent, and not enter into those social issues that Gloria described mm. so well. His yeah. mind, he's a guy who suffered in his infancy a lot. He was being beaten by his parents, and he's, he's full of, uh, I don't know, emotions that overflowed him. But I, I you know, politics is, of, of course, maybe one day we'll have Gloria's president of Guatemala influencing all Latin America, and I bet that happens one day. I will be there shouting. But, and I think that's really possible because little by little we grow. I don't know if we'll be able to see it, but I have expectations. But for the moment, if you compare Millet with, I don't know, uh, Patricia Bullrich or the candidate for, for Christina Kirchner, Mr. Massa, you see a guy with a different sense of life. I resent also some of his conservative positions, and I think that, of course, they are going... They are not going to help him to in, in his position. But compare what what we had in the past is 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 something. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from my conversation with Gloria Alvarez and Eduardo Marti about the rise of Javier Millet in Argentina. For the full conversation, click right here. For another clip from that conversation, go right here.